as entrepreneurs in Southeast Asia, what we found is that we need to move out of our country, whether we like it or not, to move to a place where we can get our businesses off the ground. In a survey that just came out about a month ago, a number of startups were asked, where would you locate your startup if you were given a choice? More than half of them basically said they would move to Singapore, primarily because it's the fundraising center for Southeast Asia. And that's a big challenge for people trying to build stuff in Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, etc., because basically, unless you're mobile, your ability to compete on a level footing at a regional level, let alone you know, at a global level, becomes very, very challenging. And when asked why, there are basically two fundamental reasons. The inability to get access to funding and also the inability to get access to talent. And those two things will cripple a startup because if you can't find the people and you can't find the money to pay for good talent, you have no ability to create the tech uh, uh, venture that you're uh, planning to create. But actually, ultimately, it's all about money. If you look at this chart, basically, in Malaysia, we raised the average capital raise per transaction was $10 million. When you compare that against Singapore, it was significantly higher. What's really interesting for a lot of policymakers is that if the government were to step in to enable Malaysian startups, as an example, to compete for talent and to compete for market growth, they would have to find a billion dollars every year to fund the same number of startups that we had last year in Malaysia. That's a lot of money that will ultimately go to waste. Why? Because most startups fail. And that money is better deployed funding social good in countries that have scarce resource. So we have to solve that problem. And we have to solve that problem because if we don't solve this problem, what you find is that if you, in the search for talent in somewhere like Southeast Asia, where you have a disparate spread of salary levels, you know, we in Malaysia will pay our, our, our benchmarks. But then if I'm trying to recruit someone from, say, Vietnam or Indonesia, they are not going to come to Malaysia because they will choose to go to somewhere where they can uh, get a better pay and pay for their family uh, expenses back home in Vietnam or Indonesia. So we have a major challenge in Malaysia. And this is probably true for many, many countries uh, in Central Asia as well as the Middle East and North Africa. And we all need devs. In Malaysia, unlike the Ukraine, we have a shortage of talent. So on a side note, if anyone wants to come to Malaysia and, and work uh, in interesting startups, please let me know after this, conf after this talk. But more seriously, the big challenge for us is that we're competing. And over and above that, when you have big companies come into Malaysia, so for example, our national oil company launched four startups last month, and they started poaching my team and they're doubling their salaries. This becomes a major, major issue for any startup hoping to compete and go to market very, very fast. But thankfully, the game has fundamentally changed. Hello Gold did an ICO last year, and we managed to raise our money so that we can compete and we can accelerate our growth path. And you will not all know about this, right? The ICO phenomenon, notwithstanding what's happening in the last six months, has been incredible in terms of getting projects off the ground very, very fast. But there have been some fundamental problems in my mind about the types of projects that have gone to market. And I think that this will change over time and change for the better. One of the first weaknesses is this. One of the great things about ICOs is that it enabled anyone, literally anywhere in the world, with just an idea to go out and raise money for that idea. A piece of paper, a white paper with some sample code, and you can go out which is amazing. For the first time ever, you, you can do that. But that created a huge amount of problems, right? Particularly in the last year, whereby many projects raised an incredible amount of money with the additional pressure and expectation of delivery, and most projects have failed to deliver on time. And that's an issue. There are, however, a small proportion of projects that came out last year that at least had a prototype and at least had an MVP. Hello Gold was one of the few that had an MVP when we went to market. We had a major partner, and we had about a couple of hundred customers. But we were in the very, very small minority. So given that context, where do we go now, and how do I see ICOs evolving over time? I think that what you're going to find is that you're going to get to a hybrid model, whereby 
you know, you have a little bit of traditional financing to get projects off the ground. You have your friends and family. You have initial seed investors coming in to basically get you to a prototypal MVP stage. And then you go out and raise the big money to then accelerate the growth. And the benefit of that are a couple, right? First of all, obviously, as entrepreneurs, as startup people, you no longer have to worry about fundraising. You can just go and just concentrate on your business. The benefit of getting angel investors and VCs in is that ultimately, funding just gets you funding. It doesn't get you the ability to focus on your business and not go down rabbit holes. I can tell you this is that when I look at some of the projects happening out in Southeast Asia that, had the, that did not have the benefit of VCs coming in and basically managing some discipline, they were able to go down many, many rabbit holes because they had $50 million to spend. They could explore everything and there was no discipline. So if we are able to do that and, and create this kind of new hybrid ICO model, what does a best practice ICO look like? I think what you're going to find is that aside from the white paper, you know, there needs to be the same kind of level of detail in the white paper that you'd expect when you give it to a VC. A detailed business plan, detailed financials, and detailed milestones. Oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, when people have come to me in, in Southeast Asia and asked me, how do I get an ICO off the ground? I always ask them, well, how much do you plan to raise? And they'll say $20 million. I said, why are you planning to raise $20 million? I said, because that's what the market wants. I said, that doesn't make sense because you need to know how you're going to spend 20 million bucks. And I think having the detailed plan, a detailed roadmap that you can hold yourself true to and also be disciplined by the marketplace is incredibly important. The other thing is that I think raising 20, 30, 40 million dollars is actually bad for a project. It's bad for a project because it gives you the latitude to not be disciplined. It means that you have the ability to literally go down every single opportunity that you see because you can afford to do so. You have the funds to burn. I think raising $40 million in and of itself is not bad, but if you do it in the right way. With Hello Gold, um, I think we did the sort of version one of that. I would not do that route ever again. Uh, we decided that we'll do a three-round ICO. So we only went out to market and raised a small amount of money with the, with the intention of going to market again once we've proved uh, our product and then raised more money. I think if I were to do the, our project again, I would raise the $40 million, but I'll escrow it. Escrow it so that we draw down against clear milestones. So, so long as we hit the milestones, we get to draw down the next tranche. If we don't hit the milestones, the funds go back to token holders. I think that's a responsible way, and it's also a way in which it ensures that as projects, we maintain project discipline in delivering what we set out to do. The other thing that I think is important is that I, I really hated the idea of bounty hunters, whereby you lose uh, control of the narrative. I think one of the important things in the tr traditional fundraising space is that you always communicate to the marketplace. It's incredibly important, particularly in this environment, as the last speaker talked about with regulation, because if you let the bounty hunters market for you, they can be promising all kinds of things to the ultimate token buyer. And that creates a problem for you ultimately, because if they're promising the token market a 10% return every month, you're still ultimately responsible for what they're saying. And I think for us, you know, keeping control of of the narrative when you go to market is very, very important from a regulatory standpoint. So where do I see things happening? I think what is really good about this space over the last six months, notwithstanding the fact that all our token prices are, are hurting, is that the retail market has left the marketplace. You see increasing institutional participation, which is good. It's smart money, which means that they're going to be able to validate good projects versus bad projects. I think this shift to Asia, I think, is set to continue. I think there's a huge amount of, of, of uh, groundswell of support amongst regulators that will, that will make ICOs flourish. I know that in Malaysia, as an example, they're looking at ICO, creating an ICO environment that makes startup funding far more accessible. And last but not least, I think regulation will come in. I think regulation will be good. One of the things, because with regulation, they come, they're 
there will be certainty. And with certainty, you're going to get better money coming in. And a lot of people are very wary of participating in this space. The big money is wary of participating in this space because they just don't know whether that money is going to disappear or not. Not because of scams, but because you know, the, the, the project becomes illegal because of the way it's been fundraised. So I believe that ICO regulation will be good for the marketplace. On that note, you know, in my discussions um, with the Malaysian authorities, and I should caveat this, I used to be a regulator, I used to work for the SEC, um, is that we can take a cigarette approach to life in terms of regulation, which is that ICOs can be bad for your health because they're all startups. Most startups lose money. And if you just create a health warning on every single document, that creates the right kind of health warning for people coming in so they can do the right kind of due diligence in terms of whether they should participate in that project or not. And last but not least, the most important thing, why I fundamentally believe that ICOs are, are good for nation building. From a financial inclusion standpoint, and, and financial inclusion is a, a, a problem that's really uh, close to my heart because Halagol is ultimately a financial inclusion play. The ability to now participate in potentially the next big thing is now universally available. Previously, before the ICO, your ability to invest in the next Google, the next Facebook, is a function of you being in Kiev, hanging around the right people, or more likely being an LP and a VC. Now, suddenly, with the ICO, everyone can pot potentially participate in some small form in the next big idea, with all the, obviously, the inherent risk associated with that. We've talked about funding and why it's important for entrepreneurs to get funded. The other aspect which I would encourage you to do so when you talk to potential investors is this, is that a lot of people say, and I used to be a part of a VC before I started this gig, um, is that I don't like ICOs because there's no governance, a lot of scams, you know, I, you know it's very, it's, there's, there's no, nothing good about it. Actually, that's not true. It's only true at a theoretical level. VCs like the traditional way of financing because they get shares, and with shares come a whole set of governance structures, checks and balances in that. But actually, that's a comfort button. It's not, it's there in theory, but it's not there in reality. What do I mean by that? If you're a VC and you go in and you take a position in the company and basically buy 5% of non-voting prefs, you have 5% of the business. You have no ability to control what I do as a founding member or as a management team. I decide what happens. If I choose to pivot, I can pivot. You may not like it, you can raise, a, you can raise uh, questions, etc. but ultimately I'm able to do what I want. And you can't get out. There's no market for private equity. It's very hard to get out of a, private, of a privately held business. So whilst you have the traditional checks and balances, actually, you're in it for the long term until there's a liquidity event, when I, until such time that I give you the opportunity to sell the shares. Conversely, in the ICO space, you actually have the opposite, right? At the point in time that you choose not to participate in my business, you have the ability to sell. You may not be able to sell at the right price, but you'll be able to get out through the exchanges, etc. You don't even need to have a reason for it. You can just do it straight away. So I believe that, and I talk to VCs about it, that in time to come, the ICO way is the better way for them to invest in a business, so long as the ICO is appropriately structured. And last but not least, in terms of nation develop, national development, what is really good about this is that suddenly, if you go back to my initial slides, you have the ability as a country to create 1,000, 10,000 potential startups to see whether you can create something that can compete against the Americans or the Chinese. And that's fundamentally important because unlike previous economies, economic uh, development phases where you had natural resources or industrialization, with this, with this phenomenon today where you're trying to create the next Airbnb, the next Google, the next Facebook, actually you're placing, you have to place a lot of uncertain bets and you don't know which one's gonna succeed. And for a lot of agencies, policymakers, balancing between funding these things or funding you know, the financial inclusion or, 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 or providing uh, subsidies for the poor becomes a huge challenge. With the ICOs, effectively, 
you can have your cake and eat it because governments can then look to using other people's money in other countries to fund the growth of a new industrial revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Robin.